people would come in and those who knew would say, I'd like to see the private gallery. Cannabis. <laughs> Cannabis. <laughs> so when you think about people who are immigrants that come over to the U.S., everybody had their medicine. So what about people who get paranoid? Oh, how much time you got? <laughs> I literally was pretty much a prisoner of my home and of the medications I was on. They had me on 11 medications. Five of those were opioids. Here's what my mom told me. She's like, whatever you do, don't get involved with marijuana or they're going to think you're a lazy Mexican. But because of that stigma, I didn't try that. Is that the medicine that our ancestors used, ayahuasca, peyote, marijuana, was taken away from us. We did not have cultura that was our own, that we had to adopt a cultura that didn't exist. There is not an American culture other than racism. What's up, mi gente? Welcome back to Banking on Cultura. I am so excited to have you here. I am your host, Victoria Jen Rodriguez. And today we're going to be talking about that puff, puff, pull, y'all. We're going to be talking about everything and anything cannabis. And I love that we're having this conversation because I had the pleasure of meeting the top Latina in the cannabis industry. And she's going to break it down for us. What's going on in the industry? What's coming down the pipeline? How you can possibly invest? And of course, all the bonchinche behind the scenes, because, you know, we, we got to get the tea. We got to get the behind the scenes. And so without further ado, welcome Christine De La Rosa to Bank on Cultura. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited for you to be here too, because we are in the heart of New York City. I got you when you were in town, mm -hmm. you know, kind of going on your investment rounds. So I'm just honored that you are here and uh, gave us the opportunity to learn more about you and your incredible story. So introduce yourself to the people. Hi, my name is Christine De La Rosa. I'm the CEO and founder of The People's Ecosystem, which is an operating cannabis company based in California and New Mexico. I'm also the fund manager for The People's Group, which is a fund that specifically invests in BIPOC and women-led cannabis companies. You also are the only Latina-owned fund Yes. Owner. Yes. <laughs> I am. Which is in, huge. In, in the cannabis space. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is huge. I mean, yes. the fact that a Latina owns a fund, period, is huge in yes. itself. Yes. Um, but being the premier in the cannabis industry, I think, is freaking amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us about your story because you didn't start in cannabis. I did not. So how did you get to cannabis? So I actually am a database architect by trade. I've worked for all of the major telecoms. I've consulted all over the world. But in my last job, I was a manager director at Verizon Wireless, and I helped put together the project. Now this is old school because now we have 5G. But before 5G, there was LTE. And so I went to Walnut Creek, California, to help produce the LTE back end for the network. So that's mm -hmm. what I did. I built databases for cell phone companies. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, I started to get sick. I was starting to not feel well. I was just like, just not myself. And at that time I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I went to 11 doctors in Dallas and every one of them were like, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know why your joints are swelling. We don't know why this is happening. And then I got transferred to California. So I did a whole other round with another 12 doctors. And they're like, yeah, we don't really know. Like, sorry, you mm. feel bad. And I was like, so shocked that nobody could figure out why I felt so terrible. Mm -hmm. And I just kept getting sicker and sicker and having to take time off of work and doing short-term disability. That's scary. It was scary. Super and scary. in on Thanksgiving Day in uh, 2010, I'm driving down the 880, and my California people will know what that is, mm -hmm. by Oakland. And I had a pulmonary embolism while I was driving, which is basically wow. a clot left my body and hit my lungs. Wow. And I remember that so clearly because I pulled off to the side of the road and I was like, what is happening to me? So an ambulance was called. I went to the hospital for seven days and it was in the hospital that they diagnosed me with lupus. Wow. And that really started my trajectory towards cannabis because in the next five years, I was unable to work. They had me on 11 medications. Five of those were opioids because at the time, opioids were the thing, right? So mm -hmm. I had in my 
medicine cabinet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Tramadol, fentanyl patches, the thing that kills people. At any time, I could use those for my pain. On top of that, I had a blood clotting disorder. I had neuropathy. I had all these things. And so I was on gabapentin, Lyrica, prednisone, which is a steroid, and it's terrible. And for five years, I lived in my house. I couldn't walk. I didn't leave my house. I didn't go grocery shopping. I was kind of a zombie. And these are my highest earning years as a person who worked. And I didn't work for those five years. I literally was pretty much a prisoner of my home and of the medications I was on. So for some reason, holidays are important to me. So it's January 1st of 2015. And I'm sitting at my desk when I could sit and filling up these huge medicine things, right? I had 11 pills I took a day, horse pills for some of them. Yeah, it was awful. And I thought there's got to be something else. There's got to be something else. And so I started to look on the internet. And You know, I thought I was going to get like ginseng tea, green tea, but this thing kept coming up for cannabis, marijuana. And um, (laughs) I was like, you know, I'm Mexicana. And one of the biggest, I think, terrible things that's happened to us as a culture is that the medicine that our ancestors used, ayahuasca, peyote, marijuana, was taken away from us. And instead, we were told to use opioids, right? These are natural, holistic plants that grow in the ground to synthetic medication that's done in a lab. So one of the reasons I never considered, and I lived in California, medical marijuana has been, you know, legal there for 20 years. It never occurred to me to go to cannabis, to even try cannabis, because when I left to go to college, here's what my mom told me. She's like, whatever you do, these are her exact words, whatever you do, don't get involved with marijuana or they're going to think you're a lazy Mexican. Because that is the trope, right? Wow, okay. That is the trope that we, that our parents were taught. Uh, so it just didn't occur to me. Yeah. So it kept coming up, kept coming up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it. Like, I'm on a five opioids. Like, how much worse could this be? Sorry, mom. Sorry, yeah. not sorry. So I went <laughs> to the dispensary that was literally two miles from my house, hobbled in with my little cane. And um, I bought a bunch of stuff. Like, I didn't know what to get. So I bought, like, smokables, vapes edibles, tinctures. I just got everything. And I started taking it. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But eventually I found things and the things that I had purchased that worked for me that I was like, oh, my knees aren't swelling. Oh, I'm using an indica so I can sleep because I hadn't slept because I almost died a second time in 2012 for pericarditis. That's a whole different story, but it's part of lupus. Okay. It it thought my heart was attacking me. So it was filling with fluid. So I just been sick for so long. And so when I started to feel better, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? It's got to be the cannabis. So I found a regimen that kind of worked for me. Mm -hmm. And then what I did is I started to take away one pill a day, one pill a week, actually. So for every week I would take a pill away, sometimes two pills away if they were the same pill. And by September of 2015, I was no longer taking the 11 medications. I was no longer going to the hospital once a month to get an infusion. Mm. I had really replaced the entire pharmaceutical regimen with a cannabis regimen. And I felt good. I was walking without a cane. I just, I was feeling myself. Mm -hmm. I was like walking upstairs. I was like, hey, (laughs) hey, I can walk up some stairs, you know? (laughs) And um, I could have- twerking? I was twerking, girl. (laughs) (laughs) But I was also- going to go back to work because now I, I felt better. I could mm-hmm. go back to Verizon. My 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 uh, job was waiting for me. And then I thought, I really can't do that because if you know anything about lupus, lupus affects African-American and Latino women the most in the U.S. And I thought of all of the groups I was in, I was in mental health groups because I was depressed because I, I had lupus. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That it impacts yeah. black and Latino women. And I most. thought I could have had my five years back if I had not had the prohibition of cannabis from my my, ma- my mother, who didn't know any better, like I'm not blaming her, but because of that stigma, I didn't try that when it first started for me. Mm-hmm. It took me five years to find it, five years that I just lost being high on opioids. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate. It's 
especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. It turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. Mm -hmm. It took me five years to find it. Five years that I just lost being high on opioids. Mm. Right. Which you can't function like I don't, nobody really functions on that. Cannabis, you can totally be functional. I'm functional now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, you take this every day, every now. day oh. since for the last what, eight years. Wow. And when I have a flare, because I still have lupus. So sometimes I'll have a flare. I need to take more cannabis. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I can tell my body, you learn this about your body. Right. Mm -hmm. So I decided to start a cannabis company. But. What we decided to do was open up an underground cannabis company in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Because in Oakland, they had this something called Measure Z, which allowed you to run a collective privately without having a license. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We opened up an underground dispensary behind our T-shirt shop. And people would come in and those who knew would say, I'd like to see the private gallery. And then we would take them to the private <laughs> I'd gallery. I'd like to see the private gallery. Yeah. And so when we first started, we were in a little closet in the, in the, in the spot and the closet was about four inches bigger than my hips. So it was really tight. Oh, it was wow. really tight and it was under the, t and then the stairs. So it was really hilarious. Uh, we started with three strains that we grew in our backyard and then the people upstairs moved. So we took over the loft space. It was about 300 square feet. And, you know, I, I thought this was just something I was doing to help my folks, people mm -hmm. I knew. I thought we were going to have like 50, 70 people that were part of our collective that had lupus or autoimmune diseases. But by the sixth month, we had 4,500 members. Wow. An 82% return rate. People kept coming back 82% of the time every month. And so I started to look around and be like, what is different about us? Like why? There was like other Measure Z clubs and what about the eight legal dispensaries? Well, most of the eight legal dispensaries were owned by white folks. We were all people of color. So people felt more comfortable coming to us. And we had a full dispensary. Like it was a time of the Wild West over there. And so even the big companies, the big legal companies would sell to us. So we had all of the vapes that everybody else had. So it was really cool. And then they passed Measure 64, which was recreational. And we got grandfathered in for another year. So that would be 2018. And then we had to become legal. Okay. So you credit that 82% rate to the fact that you were of color. Yeah. And people felt like more comfortable coming to well, you. I mean, look at the market for cannabis. It comes out of African-American and Latino cultures, mm -hmm. right? We're the ones who used it. We were the ones who made it really big. We're the ones who knew to use it for medicine, mm -hmm. right? And so we are the largest market. But what happened when recreational came over is, and there's just no polite way to say this, but... The white folks came in like, we're going to make money. We put you all in jail, but we're going to make money now. Hmm. And I don't know about you, but if you got popped for, be, for a cannabis charge, are you really going to feel comfortable going into a white company that's selling you illegal cannabis when you could literally walk out and get arrested if, if they wanted to? So there was a, a trust issue that was happening. Hmm. Interesting. Where where the cannabis originate? Was it like Colombia? Where did where it come from? You know, it comes from everywhere. They have... Um, they have artifacts of Chinese cannabis, uh -huh. like from China, like in the 1800s. 
Like cannabis was everywhere. It was in Jamaica. It was in Mexico. It was in Colombia. It's everywhere. It mm-hmm. was everywhere. It was used as a medicine. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, you got high, but not everything makes you high. Some of it was medical. You had, they had rubs for like your, your arthritis or for mm-hmm. your inflammation. So it was our, it was a plant. It was everywhere. It's like, you know, it was not native to one place. It was everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the, and you can look this up on Wikipedia, but when the U.S. took over, basically took over Mexico, right? They took this piece of Mexico where there was a lot of Mexicanos living there because it was, what? Mexico, um, <laughs> right? And, and the Mexicanos were like, we don't want Mexicans here in their land that they've lived in here since the 1500s. So they had to figure out a way to put us in jail or to deport us. Mm. And they used cannabis because cannabis was a huge, like my great-grandmother, which was Abuelita Chiquita, that's how she cured me was tinctures and cannabis and peyote and ayahuasca. Like all this stuff was in her, in her yeah. own curandera bag, right? And so if I got really sick and I lived in Texas, my mother wouldn't take me to the doctor. She would take me across the border to Nuevo Laredo to see Abuelita Chiquita. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so they used that as a way to deport Mexicans put Mexicans in jail, and then eventually as a pipeline for the African-American population here in the States. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you started this cannabis company as Mm -hmm. a result of a health scare and a need Mm -hmm. and also realizing a gap in the market. Yeah. And since then, you've been able to raise impressively about $5 million so far yes, and counting, darling. <laughs> um, and I want to get into all of that, but I also want to allow the folks to get to know a different side of you. So I want you to give us a piece of bonchinche. Oh, a piece of bonchinche. Well, how much time you got? <laughs> Girl, you got about two minutes to give us the all bonchinche. Right, <laughs> Well, I think the bonchinche, especially for um, Latinos specifically, the bonchinche is that if you're not investing in cannabis because you have this sort of framework of stigma, you need to work through that because this is going to be a huge, a huge industry Mm -hmm. that currently we're missing out on because we have that stigma Mm -hmm. of being not wanting to be seen as lazy or not wanting to be seen as thugs or not wanting to be seen Mm -hmm. as. So my bonchinche is like, find you a good company. Could be mine, could be someone else's, and invest in them because this is a holistic medication that is going to replace a lot of pharmaceuticals. So that's the first bonchinche. That's mm-hmm. like a more public bonchinche. Mm-hmm. The my personal bonchinche, yes, like my yes, personal, personal my personal bonchinche is that um, we are doing medical drinks now. Like we're going to be doing cannabis drinks that help for medical conditions um, because you know a lot of times you know there's in my opinion. There is no plus side to alcohol. To me, there's not. And and there's no record of it, actually, with the exception of red wine. But cannabis drinks, I think, will replace uh, a lot of alcoholic beverages because they are cheaper and they are medicinal and they taste good. Mm. So imagine if you could drink. And they get you lit. It gets you lit (laughs) faster than the alcohol. Really? And you don't have a hangover the next day. Interesting. So you've heard it here hmm. first. Interesting. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's 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 take a deeper dive into that bonchinche. So you said Latinos should start investing yeah. in the cannabis industry. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, because it's going to be a huge industry. So when you're thinking about what's coming up, you're thinking AI. Yesterday, all of the major banks filed with the SEC to be able to offer cryptocurrency as part of their asset offerings to their investors. Mm-hmm. Cannabis is still an alternative to the alternative markets because it's not federally legal, Mm -hmm. but you can invest in it per state. But in about 18 to 24 months, it's going to be federally legal. And at that point, all of these big companies, Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, the big institutional investors, the big funds are going to pour money into those companies that are doing well. So you want to be part of the investors. You can get in now. It'll be harder to get in later. And it is our culture. It is our, like, there's no cannabis culture without Latinos and African-American folks in the U.S. or anywhere, really. Mm. And so, again, we should be creating generational wealth from the thing that we created, Mm -hmm. the market we created. And so if we don't invest now, we have a very good chance of not being able to invest later because it will be a much higher price point. 
So if folks want to get in, like, where do they go? Well, there's a lot of places to go, but I would tell you to do your research. Again, you don't have to invest in my company, but we do have a fund. And what we do is even when people don't invest in me, I'm very passionate about educating our Latino market on who to look for. There's a ton of great companies currently in the market. And as we were talking about earlier, the Latino market in the U.S. is how much? $2.5 $2.5 trillion. Oh, 2.8 by 2025. Right. 2.8 we have trillion huge, buying power. We have a huge buying power. Mm-hmm. But when you look at cannabis across the U.S., you can see almost a very, very few companies that are addressing that market share. Mm-hmm. We're one of those companies. There's a few other companies. But the reason that's happening is because Latinos don't have access to capital. So if you're a Latino that has capital, find the the group that you feel comfortable with, that you want to invest in, because there's a huge chance that they're going to be very successful. Totally. And when you talk about investing, Mm -hmm. you... You don't need 50 grand. You don't like need You could grand. come in with 500. Yeah. You could come in with 1,000. Yeah. You can come in with like what you got. Yeah. And at our breakfast earlier, yes. you shared with me that part of your philosophy around raising funds is if you think about where you're parking your money right now, mm-hmm. you're getting like maybe 2 3% if you're lucky <laughs> right now. <laughs> if you park it in a fund... Mm-hmm. What is the average rate of return for you? Usually we're looking for anywhere from a 3X to a 10X. 10X is really a high thing, mostly around technology. What we're talking about, and this is really important for investors to understand, cannabis is an agricultural company, right? Because you have to grow a plant before you can harvest the plant and make it into products, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at agriculture versus tech, tech will give you a 10x return. Agriculture will get you about a 3x return, but we're also talking about cannabis. So I always tell people it's going to be within that 3x to 10x. It could be 5x, 7x, depending on the company, but please don't expect it to be in and out. It takes time to grow a plant. It takes time to grow your money in cannabis. So I just tell people to give about a five to seven year, like you're going to park that money Mm -hmm. and then you're going to hope, you know, in seven to 10 years, you're going to get 3X at the very bottom, 10X at the top. And Mm -hmm. we can see that actually, I can foresee that happening at federal legalization, which I think again is in 18 to 24 months, we're going to see a huge kind of hockey stick of the value of companies in the cannabis space, especially those that have prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I would tell investors is like, really look at the company. What is their strategy to exit? What is their strategy at federal legalization? These are things that you should be asking. Mm. So you've been able to raise Mm -hmm. $5 million so Mm -hmm. far, which is like insane, especially given the data around the lack of access that we have to capital. And I had the pleasure of meeting you in Napa. Shout out to Richard and the Hive. (laughs) Um, And I immediately gravitated towards you because you shared some nuggets. And I was like, ooh, she's badass. (laughs) Like, she knows her shit. And she's a Latina in cannabis. Like, I need to learn more. And I want to share these nuggets with the audience because as they are thinking about financial management, as they are thinking about entrepreneurship, as they are thinking about, like, where to start, And also how to manage yourself in rooms where you are the only, where you are the minority, the only woman, the only person of color, the only Latino. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate. It's especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. Okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey, I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. 
If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. I think it's really important for you to have these tools in like your tool shed in order to show up and show out. So let's talk about raising capital. And the story that you had shared around, I think it was like a a meeting or something that you went to and there was like these big briefcases that dudes were carrying around. (laughs) Like, tell us that story. Girl, so let me just say, I want to set the standard because you're like, $5 million, that's a lot. Girl, these guys have raised, this one group raised a half a billion dollars. Wow. They invested that half a billion dollars with a major company in California all owned by white guys. Mm -hmm. They lost all $500 million. Because if you're a white guy, they just give you $500 million and you get to burn it. That happened in Canada. So $5 million is a lot for us. That's like but that that's, dude with WeWork, right? It's totally they like that dude. Yes. All this money and then they gave him more money. To even get out. though he lost. Yeah, yes. it's crazy. It's amazing. The fail up is real. The fail up <laughs> is and real. So um. it was 2018 and I was just starting to learn, like really understand fundraising. And I got invited to the Grand Caymans for a family, a bunch of family offices that were gathering in the Grand Caymans. Where's the um, Grand Caymans? Bahamas? Where is that? It's the Bahamas in that oh, area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, and fancy. so they flew me out. Okay. It's real yeah, it fancy. Flew out. Let's, Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, but they wanted me to talk about, they were just starting to think about what it would look like to invest in cannabis, you know, so they asked me to come out and give a talk. And so the person that was hosting me, we were getting ready for our, for our panel. And, um, there were a bunch of guys with big brief- briefcases, and I kept. I finally turned to her and I said, "What is in those briefcases?" And she's like, "Oh, that's money." And I was like, "Cash money?" She's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "They just carry around cash money?" She's like, "Yeah, they're going to buy Bitcoin in 2018 when Bitcoin was like a dollar." Mm. So everybody who invested in Bitcoin in 2018 became millionaires. I have, and 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 that's what they had: cash. And the Grand Caymans is a place where people go to put their money. Like, it's really known for that. And um, some folks from Oakland, I met one lady in Oakland that had bought $10,000 in Bitcoin when it was really cheap. And she's a multimillionaire now. And so this is the thing. Like, if you follow what the rich people are doing, you will see where the money's going to be. Because had I known what Bitcoin was in 2018, I had no idea what that was. I had no idea about crypto- cryptocurrency. So I was like, wow, that's just weird that you would carry cash to buy Bitcoin. I don't understand it. But they were depositing their money into the bank to buy the Bitcoin. They became multimillionaires Mm -hmm. on just buying cryptocurrency. So cannabis is this way. Cannabis is this for us. If we don't invest in it now, in about five years, maybe 10, when it becomes a major component of your Parkinson's disease medication. They're doing studies on that now. It becomes a major component of your pain management that replaces Oxycontin, Tramadol, all that other BS. Mm. You're going to be like, why didn't I invest in cannabis? And I'm going to tell you the reason you don't invest in it is because somewhere in the psyche of our cultura, we were told that it was bad. We were told to not do that. When Had I started doing cannabis in 2010 when I first got sick, I would be way further along in my career, whether I would be in this career, I might still be as a database architect, but I'd be further along if I had not had that stigma, not had that belief system based on nothing, by the way, based on nothing, Mm -hmm. right? Just because my mom said it was bad because she was told it was bad. Well, also because they was locking everybody and their mama up. That's true too. (laughs) Well, I think it's it's that. I think, you know, there's that stigma that Mm -hmm. exists, but there's also a lack of education around- how to even penetrate the market, how to invest, mm-hmm. how much money, the how, the yeah. why, you know, the the time horizon, mm-hmm. how long you're actually going to have your money park, all of these things. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a combination of things. But you're right. Like if you're following, you know, what the rich are doing with their money. Yeah. Well, well, that depends because. Yeah, sometimes they build yeah, submarines. Yeah, sometimes they, they're. <laughs> 
parking their money somewhere and, and it doesn't work. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then you're asked out. Yeah. <laughs> so in that instance, like how can you actually be like an educated investor? I mean, obviously using a rule of thumb, okay, what are the what are the rich people doing? Yeah, yeah. AKA what are the white people doing <laughs> with their money, right? Like what are they doing? Actually, you know what? I'm going to correct myself because there's a lot of wealthy Latinos out there and people of color. So yeah. let me check myself because that is untrue. <laughs> uh, the wealthy, what they are doing and how they are choosing to invest their money outside of that mm -hmm. and outside of what you find on Google, because you can land on Google and you could read this narrative like, oh, it's amazing. You got to get in right now. Like, do it now. I mean, you saw some of that in the crypto space. You have some of these coins yeah. that were like popping because there was like all this momentum happened to me. I invested like two grand in a coin. And then like three weeks later, I'm almost completely asked out, right? Because yeah. I got caught up in the hype. That was a lesson learned that I had. So how should you be approaching this if even in your research, there could be, mm. you know, inaccurate information? I think that the best way to approach it is to really look at what the company is doing. So here's kind of my rule of thumb, and I've said this a lot over the last couple of weeks. When you're looking at cannabis companies to invest in, a lot of people want to invest in retail shops. That's shiny. It's a sale. It's customer facing. And I 100% believe in retail shops. However, at federal legalization, Amazon gets to ship cannabis across the states. Woo! Imagine you got your prime delivery on. <laughs> you got your cannabis showing yeah. up to the crib the next yeah. day. So if you don't think that that's going to ha not happen, then you're wrong. They're already preparing for that. Okay. So while retail shops are good today, are they a good investment in two, three, five years? Mm. Are we going to go the way of Bed Bath & Beyond? Are we going to go the way? Because like I remember going to Bed Bath & Beyond. It used to be one of my favorite things to do. And then after the pandemic, I would go into Bed Bath & Beyond and there was nothing on the shelves because you could buy that on Amazon. Mm. And I'm not caping for Amazon. I totally am not doing that, but you have to be able to read the tea leaves. Mm. So I tell people, if you're going to invest in a retail shop, make sure that they have a really good exit strategy, right? Talking to big folks who know the industry is one of the very first things. If you're going to invest in cannabis, schedule a meeting with me, not to invest in me, just to get some information because that's knowledge that I share. Mm -hmm. Call other people. Go to do, events. Go to events. Yeah. Talk to people about what they think in the industry and then you're going to have to make your own decision. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm like, people are like, what about distribution? I'm like, well, do you really think that all of the alcohol distributors are not going to distribute? They already have the distribution lines. Why would you invest in distribution if they're going to they, they already have all the trucks. They already have all the pallets. They already have everything. So you're going to be using one of the one of those distribution channels. So distribution to me is not necessarily a good investment if, unless there's going to be a huge distribution company that's just doing cannabis. But I don't think that's going to be the case. So when I look at it, I'm like, I'm looking at cultivators who actually make the plant. None of these other pieces in the supply chain happen without cultivators, mm -hmm. the people who actually grow the plant mm -hmm. and grow it well. Mm -hmm. So I would be investing in cultivators. And the people who make the products that go on the shelf. When I started the biz, I was had a dispensary and I quickly learned to sell it. I sold it and reinvested into manufacturing. And you might be like, well, why, Christine? Because when you're a dispensary, you got to buy 750 products to fill your store. I'd rather be the manufacturer. Who's selling the dispensary 750 to 750, 750 Yeah, mm -hmm. to 750 stores. So when you're looking at investment, those are the two places. And people always like, they're like, oh, cultivation. They don't make any money. As soon as it's federally legal, they're going to have access to all the agricultural subsidies. They're going to have plenty of money. Mm -hmm. So invest now mm -hmm. in the people that are going to be responsible for creating the plants that make your medicine, that make your recreation. Mm -hmm. Another nugget that you shared in Napa was this three mini meaning mm. framework that you have, especially <sighs> as a woman, when you are approaching men for a capital or a collaboration partnership, whatever it is. What is that framework? I want to let you know, I learned that framework in New York. Really? Yes. Okay. I had come out here in 2017 when I was just starting to raise capital the first round. And um, I was new. So, you know, I, I definitely fell for a lot of stuff. But what I learned was that it doesn't take that many meetings to get money. If you have a data room mm. that has 
all of the information. And that's what a data room should do. A data room should have everything you want an investor to know. It should answer every question so that they don't have that many questions. And whatever questions they have, put it in the data room for the next investor. Mm -hmm. So you have your first initial meeting. I always tell people 30 minutes. But where's this data room? Like where? Well, you can put it anywhere. I have it on one hub. You can have it on Docsend. Okay. There are actual data room softwares that are online in the cloud. And I have a whole thing about what you put in it. And this is where like investors go to, to actually see if it's a credible investment, That's right? right. And actually go. to be okay. like, well, what's your performa? How are you structured? How do I invest? So the first meeting is about 30 minutes. And before you had to meet them face to face, but since the pandemic, you can do that 30 minutes on Zoom, mm -hmm. which is really great, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise you spend a lot of money, money traveling. And then... If, so the first meeting is on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. And what are we discussing at that meeting? You're pitching. You're like, this is my company. You have about 20 minutes of the 30 minutes after you do the highs and hellos to be like, this is my company. This is how much money I'm looking for. This is how we're going to spend the money. And this is how we're going to get your money back to you. And if they're like, I'm interested, they sign a non-disclosure agreement and then you give them access to the data room. And usually the investors are not coming through the data room. It's their financial people, mm. right? And so and they go through the data room and they're like, hmm, does this seem viable? Does this work? Yeah, it does work. So we're going to ask for a second meeting to answer some questions, which are called due diligence questions. They're going to come back and ask you for things. You don't know what things it's going to be. It's different for every investor, but it's a due diligence process. Okay, hold on. Let's let's back up. I want to like be really slow about yeah. this because there's a lot of moving pieces. So they're signing an NDA. Why? Because there's a lot of corporate secrets in your data room, how you're going to market how you're going to spend the money, how you're going to capture the market. You're showing them your executive plan, right? What mm -hmm. takes These people have tons of money. Mm -hmm. They can just take your executive plan and go find somebody else to do the executive plan. Now, they really can't do that because, you know, you got a secret sauce. But, mm -hmm. but you know, you want to protect your intellectual property. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first meeting, mm -hmm. pitching, I'm interested. Cool. Sign this NDA. I'm going to send you more info. Mm -hmm. So that's over Zoom. Yeah. So second meeting is usually happening second, when? It's usually the second meeting if they're interested. You're not talking to them. You should be talking to their financial folks, so the people that ran through the data room so they can ask any questions and have a sense of calmness about, you know, what you're talking about. Because they're investing not only in your company, investing in you as a founder. Okay. Right? And then the final meeting should just be a signing meeting. You're signing. You're giving me some money. What I did wrong... And what I tell people now is I would go to lunch. I would go to dinner. I would do these things. I would waste a bunch of cycles, right, on people who had no intention of giving me money, but they like to hear themselves talk or they like to have a dinner companion because they were lonesome or whatever. So I always tell people, don't ever do dinner. Dinner is a no off the table until after they've invested, then you can have a dinner. But prior to that, I always say coffee. If you're going to meet in person, I say coffee date at the beginning, maybe a lunch for the second one if you need it. But after three meetings, they're not going to give you money. It's very rare. I know some people that might have gotten some money, but it costs a lot of time and energy for a not great investor. And that's the other thing that's important about investors is that you want people that believe in your vision, believe in you as a founder that are going to help you build up your company. They should be partners with you. Because their money is invested, they want to multiply their money, so they need to be part of your team. They're not just people who gave you a check. And as I was telling you at breakfast, we just had an investor meeting a couple of weeks ago, and it was super exciting, but we had an ask. At the end, we asked, hey, make sure you're following us. Make sure you're telling your friends about us. Make sure you're wearing our gear. Make sure you're buying our products. This is how investors can be helpful. Help us raise other capital. You have a friend who wants to invest, contact them. Your investors should be part of your team and helping you be successful. When do you know when an investor is full of shit? Usually when they want to have dinner. <laughs> okay. But I, hmm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. But I feel like a lot of business happens at dinners. Yes. A lot of business usually B2B. Okay. Mm -hmm. Investors are not business. They're investors. It's a different facility. So I do a lot of business over dinner. I, I go to dinner. I do my business. But investors, investors that are really serious, whether they're a family office, whether they're an individual investor, whether they're part of a, another fund, like whatever that might be, they're trying to move capital to start working. 
They're, they want to work the capital. You never want capital sitting in a bank. It makes no money sitting in a bank. Mm. So if they're being casual about it, they're not really motivated to make their money work. It means they're not motivated about you. Mm. Right? And so for me, usually dinner is in a loud place. You can't hear me. I can't hear you. I'm yelling at you. You're yelling at me. Even if we're in a quiet place, we can't talk very loudly. I can't. I don't have anything to show you. I'm just talking to you. So I have not found this to be helpful. Other people might have. I have not found them to be helpful. I have found Zoom calls to be helpful, coffee dates, lunches, where we can be in a place that's not like dark um, has been helpful so you can see me. Because like I said, you want your investor to get to know you. They're investing in you as a person, as a founder. Um, but you just don't want to waste cycles on somebody who just needs a dinner companion because they're lonely. Mm. Okay, so that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Dinner. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think um, at any point in your conversation where you feel uncomfortable, that's a red flag. And I'll tell you, I had two major things happen to me early on that I didn't trust my gut. So trust your gut. Like one of them was, I remember I was talking to somebody about why it was important for black and brown people to own in the cannabis space. I was talking specifically about social equity programs. And I remember this guy, he worked for Procter & Gamble. And I was like, ooh, Procter & Gamble, like if I could get investment, like I was really excited about it. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't really invest like, you know, in social services. Oh, Ooh, I was like, not social service. I know. Right? <laughs> You're like, you know, he's like, I'm not a welfare company. <laughs> I was like this. I was like, this. this is my face. And I was like, OK. And I stayed for a couple more minutes. And then, it, you know, it was over. And I was like, why did I think like the minute he said that I should have been like, great, thank you. And got up and left. Why waste your time? Mm -hmm. You've already told me that you're not investing in social welfare even though that's not what I'm talking about. So mm -hmm. you're already not listening to me. And it was really funny because about two years later during the pandemic, he wrote me an email. He's like, hey, I'm really interested in investing in you. And I was like, yeah, we're not taking investments, right? Because not all money is good money. Mm -hmm. Not all money is going to work for you. And what you don't need is have money working against you. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this too. A lot of times you have to be really careful with investors because their end game is to own your company get you out and own your company. So I, I haven't gone out and raised, some people raised $50 million, $500 million. I go super slow. So I make sure that everybody on my cap table, everybody who's invested in us is our advocate, is our person that helps us, not a person that wants to take over, mm -hmm. that they are invested in our success as a company, as a team. Mm -hmm. The examples. second example mm -hmm. was even worse. Okay. <laughs> the second example, I've almost never talked about this. So you're getting an ex this is a exclusive. Bon this exclusive. Is, this is a bon Let's chi -chi. go. So I'm here in New York. <laughs> I was living on Park in Park Slope. I was working with some of the folks with Governor Cuomo at the time because they were working on social equity, and I'm considered one of the premier social equity folks. And so I was helping them kind of think about how that would show up in New York, mm -hmm. right? And so I got an investor for the company. And he was willing to invest $50 million into the company. Mm. And I was, I thought I was bad shit, girl. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got $50 million from an investor. <laughs> and so we're going down the path. I have my lawyers, they have their lawyers. We agree on terms. We sign operating agreements. We sign low, um, not loan, um, investment agreements. We have everything. I think, I think, yeah, we're going to do this. I go to the bank with him to open up the account where the money is going to enter. I, I do all of those things. And the night before the first five million of the fifty million, and, and by the way, I had hired people. I had people starting to work because this money was we had signed papers. It was a sure thing. And the night before the five million, the first five million was to come in, he called me and he said, Yeah, I would like to own fifty-five percent of your company. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate, especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. 
The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. I'm like, that's not the agreement. You're not gonna be a majority owner of my company. He's like, well, then I'm not going to give you $5 million. Hmm. And I was like, oh, my God. I remember in that moment, I remember I'm standing in the bathroom of this Park Slope apartment that I have subletting. And I feel my entire body just my, I like, I was like in the ground. And I'm like, I'm going to have to call you back because I got to call my partners. So I call my partners and I said, this just happened. I said, my, as a CEO, my recommendation is that we don't do this. If this guy wants 55% of the company the day before we get $5 million for the, of the first 50, and we've already signed all the paperwork. Right. Super sleazy move. Super too. sleazy move. And they agreed with me. So I called them back and I said, yes, I, I'm going to decline. He was so mad. He yelled at me on the phone. How dare I? How I do this? How I dare? Do I know who he is? Yes, I know who you are. You're somebody who's not going to be a good partner to us. Mm. It, I had to go and lay off all my people. Damn. I had to re-pivot. I had to call people and be like, I'm sorry this happened, but this is where we are. And it took us about a year to recover from that because we had invested so much time and energy to get the paperwork done, to pay the lawyer, to do all the things. And um, yeah. So that was the second bad experience. And the reason I'm saying that is because I had glimpses of who he could be prior to that night. Mm. And I thought, no, he, you know, we're signing papers. We're, we're doing the legal things. But you know, what I found is that, and he's incredibly wealthy, super wealthy, um, is that super wealthy don't actually play by the rules. They don't care about lawyers. They're like, you got a piece of paper, sue me. Right. You got money to sue me? Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> So that was that, and that's uh, and, and that was here in New York. And I remember wow. traveling all over New York, opening up, thinking I was the thing, and then to be just un, totally let down. And two days later, I had to go speak in D.C., and I was like just crushed, crushed. So, what do you do now differently? Well, when I have a feeling, I, I go with it. That's the trusting your gut. Piece. Yeah. So if I'm talking to somebody and it doesn't, if they feel weird, and maybe they're not weird. Maybe they just. Having a weird feeling about somebody is not about they're not trustworthy. They're they're you know Sometimes suspicious. It's an energy thing. Sometimes like, it's an energy thing. Like yeah. you're like my energy is not going to mingle with your energy, mm -hmm. which means we're already always going to be at odds. And I don't want to be in a company and taking money from people where I'm going to be at odds with them. Mm -hmm. I don't want that. And so I've turned down a lot of money. I've also accepted a lot of money. And I will tell you that I feel very proud of the investors I have today because they are absolutely rooting for our success mm -hmm. as opposed to, I mean, of course they want their money. Right. Of course they do. Mm -hmm. But they're also willing to wait knowing that I'm building slowly so that we have something that's valuable at the end of this game. Wow. So, okay. So let's say... Is there anything legally that you're going to do differently? Like, will you not go out and, like, spend money you don't have yet or, like... Well, I've never done that before. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so after that happened, my my biggest thing was, like, people be like, oh, I'm going to give you some money. I'm like, until it's in the bank, I act like I don't have it. Mm. Until it's not only in the bank, cleared a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> right. Make sure I that check yeah, I'll, I'll, clear, yes. baby. And so that's one <laughs> of the things that I definitely did differently because it just never occurred to me when you come from where I come from, 
your word is your bond, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I come from a very, you know, lower middle class family. When you made an agreement, if you signed an agreement, even worse, but not worse, but even more tight. But if you told somebody, I'm going to do this thing, you did that thing. If you sign paper saying you're going to do that thing, you were in a contract. So having to learn that that's not how some people who are wealthy act, you learn to just really be super careful and do everything legally, of course, but also wait. Don't assume mm. that that money is going to come even if they sign something. Mm. Interesting. So, okay. So let's say you come across another investor who mm-hmm. wants to give you a hundred milli, mm-hmm. right? Are you going out and hiring the lawyers to draft the paperwork? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. I mean, they have their own lawyers. So there's still a cost of doing business, even that type of Mm -hmm. conversation to get an agreement going. Yeah. Okay. And it costs money to get money. And you want want it to be, they have their own lawyers, but you want your lawyers to draft up your agreements. And then their lawyers can do what's called red line for things that they don't agree with. But having control over the paperwork is important for you as a founder to make sure that you're in the investment you're coming in, you understand your obligations to that investor and the investor understands their obligations mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that, and I did that like in, in that scenario where I got totally screwed over, it was my lawyers that put it together. Mm-hmm. I did everything right. You can, and that's the other thing I want to tell founders, all founders, but especially women founders, you can do everything right. And still have somebody kick the table out from under you. And so you can't, and I spent about a year being really crushed. Like my confidence was crushed. Like I'm like, oh my God, how could I fall for this? And then I realized it wasn't me. I did what I was supposed to do. But when you have a person in your sphere that doesn't have integrity, that's not a reflection on you. That's a reflection on them. But you do have to learn from that. You absolutely have to learn from it because if you make the mistake a second time, that is on you. Mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that Mm -hmm. because I know that happens more often (laughs) than not because savages out here, you know, people are trying to steal up your ideas, your Mm -hmm. IP, your company, especially people with money because they do have leverage. I mean, that's the fact of the matter. But they don't always have creativity. Mm. And I always tell this to my founders. I I now mentor a lot of founders and talk about my story, you know, about how to raise capital and all that stuff. And I tell them, I say, you know, people with money have a lot of opportunity because they have money. But a lot of times they don't have the creativity or the, if you're like me, a geek, the coding ability to be able to actually use that money. And so they need the founders that have the creativity, that have the idea, that have the out of, I mean, I'm sure the first person that was like, I'm going to make an AI thing. The first person, like, I don't know, really know of any investors that can do that. I mean, Mm -hmm. when you look at Elon Musk, who's not a genius, he just had money. And so he bought Tesla. He didn't make Tesla. He bought Twitter. He didn't make Twitter. So founders are very important. So know your worth. Don't think that you're not very worthwhile in when you're asking for money and don't let any investor, any investor try to tell you that you're nothing without them. Mm, Interesting. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, Mm -hmm. would your advice to a founder be to bootstrap or go out there and fundraise? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I always say bootstrap until you have some traction, right? And bootstrap doesn't mean do it yourself. When we started our very first fundraise, the first million we ever raised was from our community, not family and friends, because our family and friends don't have money. Like my family and friends don't have money. And a lot of other folks who are white, they have family and friends that can write a $10,000 check, no problem. Mm -hmm. So we went out to our community and we asked our community to invest in us. And um, we basically did a crowdfund for that first million. We didn't, at that time, there were no crowdfunding platforms. So we had to do it old school with lawyers and all that way. But we were able to raise that first million. And and I'll tell you, we were very upfront because at that time it was even more tricky about whether cannabis was going to actually hit, right? I believed it was, but, you know, 
that was right at the transition into the Trump era. There was a lot of things going on. So we, I started every, every investor call and I did a thousand investor calls, like so many investor calls. I started, this is an investment, not a loan. You could lose all of your money. This is a very high, like I just said it at the beginning so that people would know that. And so we, we bootstrapped, but we bootstrapped using community dollars who believed in what we were doing, you know, for, for the community and for cannabis in general. So I would tell people bootstrap, but if you don't have the money yourself, try to see who in your community believes in what you're trying to do. Because if you get big investment up front, they're going to own more of your company. Mm-hmm. If you don't really, ha- if you just have an idea and you find an investor that believes in your idea, they're going to own your company. If you're able to bootstrap it, you will end up, oh, it, eventually, eventually you'll have to let go more and more of your company. Don't do it at front. At front, you're worth zero because you just have an idea. So they can be like, I'm going to own 90% of your company. And what are you going to do? It's a thought. But if you have built it over a course of one, two, three years, and when you built it, now you're worth $10 million, they're going to, and they can invest a million, they're only going to own 10% of your company. So when you can build the value of your company before accepting large investments. Hmm. Interesting. Have you ever had an investor ask you, how, how much money have you invested on your own? How oh, much all of your the time. own money? Yeah. Oh, they do. Yeah, okay. they do all the time. And I have a number. Okay. I'm like, this, this founder invested 400,000. I've invested 600,000. This other investor has, inv- the other founder, there's three of us. The other founder has invested 250. So yeah, we cashed out 401ks. So yeah, we did invest in our own company. Do they use that as a measurement for like your seriousness? I don't know if they use it as a measurement for um, the seriousness of it. I think they want to know that you have skin in the game, but you don't have to make big investments into your own company to have skin in the game. You have a company, that's your skin. Everything that you're doing is around you making your company successful. And it doesn't always have to be dollars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It can be commitment. It could be, I work 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, 120 hours a week. I don't go to sleep. You know, like, you mm-hmm. know, it can be all those things. So I always find that when I have an investor ask that question, I'm like, yes, I've invested X amount of dollars. And I think at this point, the three of us invested over 800,000 into the company. Mm-hmm. But more importantly than the 800,000, we've been able to build this large company where other people have had half a billion dollars to do the company, we've done it on five. That should show you that we're budgetary conscious, we're good with money, and we believe in being financially accountable to our investors. That's more important about how much money I put into the company. Mm. Talk your shit, girl. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you've been an entrepreneur now how long? Oh, geez. My first company was in the 90s. I had a tech company in the 90s and I sold that company. And then I was a consultant for a long time, which is an entrepreneurial mm-hmm. thing. When you don't have a 401k and you don't have insurance yeah. and you cover that, you're an entrepreneur, even if you're a single entrepreneur, solo entrepreneur. So probably my whole life. I mean, the only full-time job I ever had was with Verizon Wireless. And I had that for seven years from mm-hmm. 2000 to 2007. Mm-hmm. So I feel like my whole life has been entrepreneurial. Yeah. Yeah. So the example that you shared with us so courageously about this dude Mm -hmm. who wanted to invest the 50 million after that, you slowed my role, slowed your role, (laughs) but you started questioning yourself. I did. Self-doubt started looming. And Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's tons of other examples of that. Mm -hmm. So how do you get through that? And how do you process it in such a way where you're like, you're going to stick it out and Mm -hmm. not give up? I think for me, I don't know how other people do it, but for me, it was having a very tight group of friends that were able to help me process that, believed in me when I wanted to be like, oh, I'm terrible at this. Or like, no, this is a one person. Like, this person is a terrible person. You're not a terrible person. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they really just, they kind of, no, they didn't kind of, they nursed me back to health to Mm -hmm. health in my confidence, because that's a big confidence buster. It took me like a year, like I said, almost a year to get back to where I was like, oh yeah, I can do this. Oh yeah, this is not about me. This wasn't an indictment on me. It wasn't a commentary on me. It was a commentary on this guy, this really mean and small guy. You can be a billionaire and still be a very small person. And so I, I think for me, it was having, and, and not just friends, but my founders, my two founders that were around me, they also still believed in me. They were like, yeah, this isn't you. Like, let's get back to where we were. And I think I would have done it faster, but we went immediately into the pandemic. Like that happened to me in April, May of 2019. Mm. And I was really devastated. 
And then I was coming into 2020, like it's a new year, I'm ready to go. And then, and you know, what's funny was that I had raised, I'd come out to Chicago for the NBA Mm All-Stars in 2020. And I had raised $6 million and they were coming to sign my paper. We were going to buy this, this company. It was a group of investors that came out of American Airlines, Delta and United. And I'd gone to to Chicago to close the deal. So they were going to fly to San Francisco to see the location and also sign the paperwork for the investment. And a week before they were going to come, they closed the airlines for the pandemic. Wow. And I remember they called me like, we still want to give you the $6 million, but, you know, we're with United Delta. We don't know what's happening. So let's see what goes on in June. We'll come out in June. And by the time June, we were still closed down. There was some travel but I lost the six million and not because of anything I did or even anything they did. It was just what happened in the world. Mm. So again, there's a place where you get something, you're like, woohoo. But see, I was like, until the money clears bank. <laughs> right, right. I'm not gonna, get too, high. Yeah. Not but, gonna get too high. Not gonna get too high. But so I, I've raised capital and I've lost capital. And yeah. sometimes it's not it's a literally a global pandemic. So like you just have to keep it moving. And that's kind of what I learned from the first encounter was like, I can let this devastate me, or I can be like, that guy's an asshole. Let's move on. Mm. So, I want to know more about the emotional roller coaster. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> the emotional roller coaster because entrepreneurship is hard, mm. very, very hard. Yeah. And when you're playing at the level you're playing at, mm-hmm. there are different pressures, yeah, different triggers, mm-hmm. <laughs> different things that are happening. And that you're responsible for, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Team, investors, yeah. all the things. How do you manage through that type of responsibility? Because for some, they might say, you know what? I'm going to live a simple, peaceful ass life, make my 50 grand a year. I don't have to answer to nobody. I'm good. I go to work. I come home. Like, why have you chosen this life? And how do you manage it all? Cannabis. <laughs> Cannabis. <laughs> As the answer for everything. Cannabis, darling. Hello, <laughs> cannabis. Um, no, seriously. I mean, though, that does help. <laughs> um, seriously, though, I think what it is for me is that I've never felt comfortable. And, and I wish I did. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I wish I'm like, I could just make my 50 grand have a simple life. Like, sometimes that does cross my mind. I think it crossed every entrepreneur's mind where That's they're like, true. I could just be living a pretty good life and not having all of the Chilling. stress. Yeah. Chilling. Taking my two weeks vacation, going whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes that cross, I'm like, oh, that looks really good. And then I'll tell my husband that. And my husband will start laughing at me. And he's like, the second that you retire, he's like, you're going to start working on something else. <laughs> he's like, that's who you are. That's who, And that's true. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm, I just want to sit around for the next year. He's like, you can't sit around for two minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that part of that is, is that just knowing who you are, neither one is good or bad, better than the other. If you're somebody who wants a simple life where you don't have a lot of stress, that you just live a life and you have a peaceful and meaningful life, and that's how your meaning happens, you should do it. But some people want to be entrepreneurs. Some people want to be personalities. Some people want to be all sorts of different things. And when you have that drive to dampen it is to live a half-life. If you're a person who wants to have a simple life and you're an entrepreneur and you're an entrepreneur, you're also living a half-life. It's about finding what it is that will satisfy you, encourage you, enchant you. What is magic Mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. And then that's enough. It doesn't have, you don't have to aspire for anything else. Just know what that magic is for you. Mm. And fighting through the fear. Man, that's a tough one. Again, cannabis. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The fear is a real thing, man. I have laid up at night with so much anxiety. Like, oh my God, is it going to happen? Did I make the right decision? Did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? I mean, it is just something that you're with all the time and you have to become peaceful with it. You have to believe in what you're doing. And also, this is a really big thing, understand the pivot. So where I thought my company was going to be back in 2017, well, we started in 2016, back in 2016, is totally not where we are today. Because over the course of the last nine years, I've learned things. I've increased my knowledge about things. I did things. I failed at things. And so as long as you're willing to pivot, 
to not be so married to the idea you started with, but to understand the idea you're going to. If you understand the pivot, you will be successful because you pivot out of the thing that's not working. If you stick, if you're so that God that you're going to stubborn, if you're going to sit, sit with that, you're going to be like, this is the only way it can happen. You're going to fail. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you say, I have fear, but this is not working, I'm going to pivot. Cause when we started, we wanted to have dispensaries. I don't have a dispensary today because I learned it's not what I wanted. So how do you know when it's not working versus you need to be patient and stick it out? I think it's a very hard thing to just figure out in general. What has been helpful for me is that how hard is it? What is that barrier for me? Is that barrier that the time for me is just not right? Or is that barrier that I'm trying to put a square peg into a round hole, right? And I think it's different for every founder to make that decision. And I question that decision all the time when I decided to pivot. Like I, when we started, we were going to own dispensaries. And then I got in, we bought a dispensary. We were running a dispensary. I'm like, this is not the business. Mm -hmm. I don't want to own dispensaries. I want to own manufacturing companies. That was a huge pivot. People thought we were crazy. They're like, you own a dispensary. I'm like, who cares? It doesn't make enough money. I want mo- I want to make more money. And I remember when we met as a board to sell the dispensary, they were like, are you sure? I said, we're going to make three times what we bought it for. And we're just going to take that money and start an exit. We're re- reinvesting it into the manufacturing companies. And it ended up being a great decision. But I think you always question that. Mm-hmm. But also, I think there's data. There's data that shows you, like when you're making that decision, there is data there that tells you this is not working or this is working. Read your data. Mm. And like what what in your data are you reading exactly? Like, Well, what? for instance, for us, we were buying from manufacturers. So I had one dispensary that was buying, let's say, 100 products a month to sell. That's one dispensary. We made 100 products. There was a cap to how much money we could make in a month based on how much we purchased, Mm -hmm. right? And then I went to a manufacturing facility and realized the thing that I bought 10 of, they were making 1,000 of because they were selling 10 to me, 10 to the dispensary down the street, 100 to the dispensary up the street, 400 to the dispensary in the other town. And I'm like, oh, so I could build – I could – literally manufacture a thousand pieces of something and sell it to every dispensary. I can be one dispensary selling 10 of them. Mm. That doesn't seem like a good plan for me. Right. So that was a data driven decision for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what if you're a founder and like the numbers just don't intrigue you? Like you just don't want to pay attention to the numbers. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, regardless of who you are, you have to pay attention to your numbers because you are the person they're investing in. So you need to know your numbers, but you don't have to do your numbers. So for that, you hire someone who can come in and help you model your financials, which is what I do. Mm-hmm. I have a person that models all my financials and then teaches me about what he modeled so that I can speak to it with investors. Mm. But I'm not the person, I didn't go to school for that. So you find the talent that can do that for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then can also train you up so you have your your talking points That's right. when you're out there. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the Talk That Talk segment. Okay. And this is something taboo in the mm, cultura. Yeah. And you touched on this earlier, but mm-hmm. I want to take a deeper dive. So okay. the stigma that exists within the Latino community yeah. around alternative medicine, mm-hmm. cannabis, like how do we create a shift mm-hmm. around Education. that? Education. We have to educate our people in not only in the fact that it is medicinal, but it's also creative. Like there, I mean, you're seeing right now a big movement in psychedelics, right? You're seeing a big movement in ayahuasca, in peyote. All of these are holistic and people are like, well, I'm going to get high. Okay. For a little bit, like what's the problem there to open your mind, to open your heart to do. And I know that sounds really woo woo and I'm not woo woo, but I think education and having people not be afraid. Mm -hmm. What are you afraid of when you think about cannabis? Like if you ask people this question, and I have, when you ask people like, what makes you afraid? I'm afraid I'm going to lose control. It's almost always the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And so you educate them and you say, if you use CBD, 
that's not psychoactive. You're not going to lose control. Mm -hmm. If you use an indica, <laughs> you're going to fall asleep and have very restful sleep. Mm -hmm. You're not going to use con lose control. If you want to be creative, if you want to open up your, if you're a creative person and you have a sativa, not every sativa, but there's certain sativas that, so all these words that I'm using, a lot of Latinos have never heard these words. Mm -hmm. So they're like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Education is the way to do it, to really be able to teach people about how cannabis works. There's so many ways in which it works. I take a particular type of cannabis, a particular type of strain to manage my inflammation, right? So it doesn't make me super high. It makes me much more alert. I always tell people, it's like everything's flickering. The light's a little bit brighter. The world looks a little bit better. It's not rose-colored glasses. It's just that it's working in my body to reduce the inflammation in my legs, to reduce my pain levels. You know what I mean? And um, I'm never like, so high, I can't talk to you. And I never really consider myself high because I've, it's an adaptable thing. You learn to work within that framework, just like everybody else. Like if you think about people who have to take anti-anxiety meds, you're working with the, infra the framework of what the anti-anxiety meds are doing for you. Mm. There's also cannabis that helps with anxiety. So it's very similar. If you're taking a Vicodin, you are high. And learning how to live with that high. So people are like, oh, you're high. Dude, I was high for like five years <laughs> on synthetic medications. Yeah. And so I think if you're interested, if you're really trying to remove the colonial mindset that has been por forced upon us and you say, I want to learn about the plant of my ancestors, that education will change your mind. It changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that I work with, they're like, oh. I could use it this way. Mm. So what about people who get paranoid? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there are particular strains. There's over, there's hundreds of strains of cannabis. Right. There's cannabis that's been mutated, cannabis that's been crossed with other things. Uh -huh. So understanding what the strains do um, is important. Okay. So to be like, it's like if you are a person that suffers from paranoia when you get high, don't take a sativa. A sativa will help with the paranoia. Oh. You're looking to take what's called an indica can make you sleep. So if you're like, well, I don't really want to go to sleep. You're looking for a hybrid, a hybrid that has an indica dominant strain and a sativa. Like think about it this way, an indica dominant strain and a sativa, you know, shot. Like if you think about drinks, like you'll have a drink and then a shot. So these work together so that it more than likely will not allow you to get paranoid. Mm -hmm. You'll have a more mellow experience. If you take a pure sativa and you are worried about having that effect, more than likely you're going to get it. So education and understanding how to partake in the plant. I want to touch on real quickly mm -hmm. the colonialism yeah. around cannabis. Like, where does that start? I know you kind of made a little bit of gesture towards it in our yeah. conversation earlier, but where is it rooted in? So I think one of the biggest, that's the word I'm looking for, the biggest myths in American culture, and I think you might be too young to remember this, but back when I was growing up, the thing that was on TV for kids was being a melting pot. America was a melting pot. Mm -hmm. And I remember people would be like, see, we're I don't see color right? because we're a melting pot. But that was actually a way to separate us from our culture. So when you think about people who are immigrants that come over to the U.S., everybody had their medicine. Chinese folks had opium. We had cannabis. Other people had mushrooms. The very first thing America tries to do is to homogenize us and strip our culture. Mm -hmm. Right? So we're smart now, but we were not smart then. We were like, yes, we're a melting pot. We shouldn't see color. We should call ourselves Hispanics, not who we are. Mexicanos, Dominicanos. Like, we should be a melting pot. That's where the colonialism in my lifetime started because it took me a while. Like, that's why I, I, I speak Spanish, but not fluently because my mother was so afraid that I would speak Spanish in school and be deemed one of those Mexicans who doesn't know English. So she, mm -hmm. I can understand Spanish from anywhere, anybody. But if I had to have a conversation, an advanced conversation, I couldn't do it. That's why we talk Spanglish on the show. That's right. <laughs> Because we embrace <laughs> that identity in the culture, right. okay? Yes. <laughs> but that's what, so you think about that, 
we were being stripped of our culture. Mm -hmm. That little show on Saturday morning is like, we're a melting pot. That was to tell us like we were not individualistic. We did not have cultura that was our own, that we had to adopt a cultura that didn't exist. There is not an American culture other than racism. Mm. That's the culture of America. So when we were being told that, we were being stripped of our own culture because it makes us weaker if we don't have our culture around us as a culture. So if you want to keep people down, that's the first thing you take, their medicine and their culture. And that's what they did. Wow. That was like a mic drop right there. Okay. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being on Begging on Cultura, for dropping so many gems and for educating us on the industry, how to raise money as a founder, like just so many nuggets. I hope you guys took a lot of notes and watch this episode Mm -hmm. again if you need to, because there's just so many key takeaways from this. So thank you so much. Let the people know where they can find you, how they can invest in your company, how they can purchase some product. Mm -hmm. By the way, a lot of us had the pleasure of experiencing the product when we were in Napa and it was a rave. It was amazing. (laughs) We need this every single year. It was, um, it was awesome to experience because it was Latina owned. It yes. was badass. And her team was badass. And it was just so felt so right. <laughs> and so amazing. So please tell the people where they sure. can find more. So you can find us on all social medias as the people's ecosystem. And then you can find me on all social media platforms as Miss Chris with an M I Z C H R I S. And if you're interested in investing, just grab us through one of those channels and we will reach out to you. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Hermana, for being no, here. Thank you. I appreciate it. And here's to the takeover. Let's do it. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, mama. Thank you. (laughs) Hola, mi gente. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Don't forget to make sure and leave a review. This is super important because this is how we're measured on the different audio platforms. So if you want to hear more of Banking on Cultura, if you were vibing, if you had takeaways, if you just enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a review. I appreciate you so much. Until next time. 